Okay, so time is slowly approaching, so I guess it's safe to start. Uh, we are going to tell you about st uh, stateful stream processing. State is a really important part of the applications that you are uh, writing and streaming. And we would like to convince you that there are a lot of frameworks out there that have different mechanisms to deal with state. And we would like to help you to choose the right framework for your needs. Uh, and um, originally this was uh, a talk submitted by myself, but when my colleague Gabor uh, joined the initiative to come here to Fling Forward, we decided to share the pleasure, so we are doing the talk together. So, uh, as I already told you, the meat of this talk is going to be stateful processing, but to actually understand what that means, we are going to tell uh, you about some motivation, some open source systems that we are going to visit, the runtime architecture of these systems, and then fault tolerance, because that's, that is practically the most important part when it comes to stateful stream processing, is that you want to make sure that your state is safe, that it's persisted, that it's durable. So that's basically the architecture that is needed to make sure that you can rely on a system to keep your safe, uh, state safe. So, let's have a couple of examples. What are you using stream processing for? That's the current hype to use stream processing, so you better have your use cases for that. So, most easy use case, if you wish, ETL style uh, use cases. One of the use cases that we've seen uh, with Buick Telecom, for example, they do some mapping, some filtering, data enrichment, basically. That's one of the first um, use cases there. Usually there you don't have, or you rather have minimal state. That's not the interesting part right now. What happens if you go into window aggregations? Well, then if you have a large window buffer and suddenly it's lost because your machine is down, how do you retrieve that? How does the system retrieve that for you? That's some application where you have state. What happens if you go to more complex applications like machine learning, there you have the model state, or if you go to like pattern recognition where you use a finite state machine to actually t uh, track the state of your application and do fraud detection, obviously you have state. So how does Apache uh, deal with uh, these problems? How does the stream processing systems in Apache deal with these kind of problems? Gabor is going to give you an introduction on those systems. Okay, can you hear me now? Oh, great. Thank you, Martin, for the introduction. So let's look at the open source stream, stream processing systems. Uh, actually, the Apache stream processing system, these four are the main top level Apache project that deals with stream processing, and we're going to talk about these. So I guess everybody knows these, like Storm uh, is a, is, was the first uh, project that kicked off the large scale distributed stream processing, and it has a nice data flow abstraction with spouts and bolts. And we have Flink, and everybody knows Flink because that's why we are here. That has really flexible operators and windowing operators, state operators, and has low latency, high throughput, uh, and also has a batch uh, system. And we have Samza, that's a really uh, that's a pluggable system uh, with uh, built on top of Kafka and other durable message uh, queues. And we all know also Spark. Uh, that has a strong community and uh, a lot of users and pretty mainstream and uh, has a unified batch uh, and stream processing engine and it builds on uh, batch processing. Uh, so uh, by definition it's good with, it has good integration with batch programs. Okay, so what are the runtimes of these systems? First, we have native streaming. Storm, Samza, and Flink has a kind of native, native streaming. And by that, I mean that the stream gets processed in a record-by-record record basis, that we have the records here and that flows through all operators and gets processed. And it looks like something like a distributed data flow runtime. And I guess we heard a lot of talk about these. It's just simply a pipeline and of, of streams. So we have operators that are connected with pipes, and these operators are parallelized uh, at multiple nodes, multiple machines, and all the data flows through this pipeline. And it's good because it's really expressive, and it can provide low latency. But uh, of course, 
uh, you need to deal with uh, things like fault tolerance, and that's not easy, and we will see that it's not that easy. And also, if you want to use this for batch processing, it's not always a good fit because you might not have that high throughput as you would have in a batch processing system. Okay, so, and we also have uh, micro-batching and Spark implements micro-batching that basically means we take the records that comes in the stream, the infinite stream, and we divide it into really small batches and we do batch processing on them. A lot of small batch processing. And it's uh, it's good because it's really good, easy to reason about this. It has all the advantages, or, or almost all the advantages of batch processing. So we can reason about this uh, it really great, and uh, and we can get a by this we can get the fault tolerance almost for free. So it, uh, it's pretty easy to implement fault tolerance in these systems, but we don't always have uh, low latency because the latency depends on these batch sizes. So we have like time, uh, uh, time slices and if the time slice is large then we won't have a latency lower than that time slice. Okay, so what about fault tolerance? Actually fault tolerance is a big issue here because we are talking about distributed for uh, processing. We have multiple nodes failure can happen, and actually s the streaming uh, systems run uh, most of the time 24-7, so failures do happen, and we need to deal with that, and uh, in, a in, in a stream processing we need to recover really fast, because the stream comes in an infinite way, in an un unbounded way, and we want to have low latency, and if a failure happens we don't have hours to recover our states, and all the stuff, so we need to act fast. So it's a challenge. And uh, yeah, and so because of this, uh, we have uh, multiple kind of semantics, or these systems have multiple semantics, like at least once or exactly one semantics that basically means that every record that the system sees gets processed at an at, an at least once once manner, so a record might get processed twice or three times. And uh, exactly once means that we guarantee that the record that we see gets processed one and exactly once. Okay, so how does Storm implements this? Storm actually tracks down the incoming records uh, with in a in a DAG, and and from the root of the, uh, of the record, from the source, from the spout, and it builds this graph in a tricky way in a tricky compressed way, and if some uh, and if th and this record gets processed, if this record flows through all the operators and finishes, it gets acknowledged, and if not, if, fail if some failure happens, the record is going to get sent through all the operators again from the beginning, from the spout, from the source. Uh, so. Here we get at least one semantics, because if some failure happens, it might mean that a record got processed somewhere there, but, but we reprocess it, so we might reprocess it twice. Okay, so Samza is, uh, Samza is pretty good in that manner that it can implement the fault runs pretty easily, because it relies on a, a durable message queue it can be Kafka or it can be uh, your own durable message queue, but it needs to be durable, and that means that it needs to have partitions and offsets. And offsets means the record that we're at, the index of the record that we're at, in a partition. So this stream, this this might represent a Kafka topic or like Kafka queue. Uh, so if you have something like this, then it's easy to implement fault runs because what SAMSA does is simply takes uh, the, the offsets, the records that we're at at the time, and makes a checkpoint time by time. So, and if some failure happens, it can go back to the last checkpoint and replay all the records again, and we got uh, at least one semantics again. Okay, so. Flink checkpointing. How Flink, Flink is is a kind is a has a really nice lightweight checkpointing. Uh, what basically happens is 
Flink sends uh, checkpoint barriers through the stream. And if this barrier reaches an operator, the operator uh, do, do a checkpointing. So, so b this way we get a consistent global checkpointing because, uh, because we will checkpoint if we reach all the operators. And yeah, it's, it's really good. And Spark, Spark also has exactly one semantics. Uh, as I've said, it has immutable data model, so it's really easy to recompute this da these data model. It's like a micro batch or mini batch processing. So we have RDDs, like resilient distributed data sets, and and uh, we checkpoint them. And if some failure happens, because it's immutable and because it's mini batch, it's easy to uh, recompute them. And yeah, so. Let's get to stateful stream processing, and Martin's going to talk about that. OK, so now when the dust settles, we have a couple of stream processing engines, and we have some failure mechanisms. So let's start building stateful applications on top of them. Uh, let's uh, rehearse a little bit what's a st what does a stateful application do. But practically, originally, when you are writing one of these distributed uh, data flow programs, you have an input and an output, and you define a function between them. What's different when it comes to stateful processing is that now you not only have your input, but you have a current state, and you can use that to compute your output and to maybe modify your state. That's practically the vision. That's what we would like to implement in these systems, but we want to make sure that this state is persisted, and in case of a failure, it can be retrieved. So let's start with Storm. How do we build an exactly once application? Usually when it comes to state, we want to have exactly once guarantees. While it's really easy, if you want to have a counter and you have at least once guarantees, then you may count things twice or three times. Usually that's not what you, want, uh, what you want. So usually you are shooting for exactly once when it comes to state. So you have a nice at least once guarantee uh, algorithm for Storm, how do you make that exactly once? Uh, one of the things that you can do is actually commit at, ev uh, at the end of every record and wait uh, with that, uh, for that commit before you send the next record. Well, that wouldn't have the nicest throughput, so let's batch up records. Let's do a couple of optimizations and you are sort of arriving at Trident. That's the way from Storm to Trident practically and really oversimplified, to be honest. But the problem with that is that, and that's why the Trident API is not so easy to use, if, is that you have this commit phase. And it's quite difficult to do a distributed commit in the setting in the API that Trident uh, does for you. It also defines a couple of abstractions and uh, tells you when you can actually achieve exactly one semantics for your state. but if you dig deep into the code and you read a couple of blog posts around it and you go to the storm mailing list, what you will actually see is the recommendation is that you should either use Stor uh, Storm's uh, memory map uh, abstraction or just use idempotent states, which means you should use states where it doesn't matter if it, uh, you update them twice. So it's some, from my point of view, it's somewhat a, a half solution in a couple of use cases. Uh, yeah, just bear with me for a second. Basically, what I want to demonstrate here is the way uh, Trident defines uh, a stateful program is you define your state, uh, state. This is a word count program. And the most important part is here, persistent aggregate. So you define that you want to have this thing persistent. You say that you want to use this memory map abstraction and of course the backend is pluggable for your state. And then you say that you, you want to actually count on the field of count. Fair enough. The way you actually access this state is with another stream. Uh, Storm has this distributed remote protocol called abstraction, which defines another uh, Storm topology, and you uh, access your states through that. Quite straightforward for most of the applications, this is the way to go in terms of API. So how do you do this in Spark? 
it's tricky in Spark because, as you remember, Gabriel told you that in Spark you have many batches. And usually when it comes to state, the way you think about state is, okay, I have these long-running operators, and inside them I have this, my state. But if I don't have long-running operators, how do I have state? And how do I reason about them? So in Spark, uh, the Spark guys uh, made a ne really neat abstraction for having uh, this uh, update, uh, this state data stream. So in Spark, you have this D stream abstraction, which is just a sequence of your RDDs. And if you have this data D stream, you can also define uh, a state D stream, which accompanies the data data stream. And uh, you can compute your current state by taking the previous state and the current data and applying a user-defined function on that. I will tell, uh, show you an example in a second and then it gets a bit more clear, but practically this is the way uh, you build uh, a stateful program in Spark. And under the hood, it is actually translated to two D streams that are getting co-grouped for each RDD. And that's not necessarily the most performant solution and I will tell you why. So how does uh, a stateful word count look in Spark then? Well, given that you already have your words D stream, I told you that you can do updates by key, state updates by key, and you need to define this update function, and that's where the trick happens. So your update function takes the new data values from the current RDD chunk and the previous state and does some Scala computation on that, that the user can define. In this case, it just sums up the counts. Okay, let's go to SAMSA then. Well, as usually in SAMSA, if you have a difficult problem, you just push it out to the durable message queue and bam, it's solved. Uh, that's, uh, that's a really nice approach when it comes to fault tolerance, and it's quite nice when it comes to states. Uh, practically the way you, the guy, the, the first impression there is, okay, I have this durable message queue, presumably Kafka, and I would like to checkpoint my state. What do I do? I just push the log of my state to Kafka, and then I'm done. And then you can also improve this a little bit, saying that, okay, I know that I have, uh, th this data is going to be accessed locally. So when I access it locally, I shouldn't go to Kafka and fetch it. I should have a local data store that's here, Usually it's, it's level DB or rugs DB, but it's configurable as everything in SAMSA. And uh, then the log of this DB is actually persisted in Kafka, in, uh, so in case of failure, you can get back to a nice state. Uh, one thing to note is actually this architecture, like this, is just at least once. Because if failure happens, you go back and uh, just like in st and the original acknowledging system of so Storm, you can actually read messages twice. So you can make this approach uh, uh, exactly once, but then you need some uh, caching at the sinks practically. So how does the API look in Samza? Now we are inside an operator that is doing the, the counting for word count, and we are receiving the words, and we have an internal hash map that is actually storing the counts and we are updating that. So how does the API look like? Practically, you would, in a uh, general setting, you would have a hash map here. Now you have the key value store of SAMSA and then everything is taken care of. So it's a quite, API-wise, it's a really neat abstraction and easy to program against. Okay, so let's get to Flink 091. Gabor told you that this uh, asynchronous uh, distributed snapshotting system is um, triggering uh, the snapshots of, of the state. And uh, the Flink community decided to both give you something that uh, the SAMSA solution we've just seen uh, gives you a local uh, or task uh, access pattern and a partitioned access pattern that we have seen in Spark. So you can do updates by key and uh, it has uh, nice integration both with the Java and the Scala API, and I will showcase that in a moment. So if you want to do a stateful word count in, in Flink, one of, uh, piece of code that you might write is actually getting your words, defining that your key is actually the word itself, 
and this is a Scala API, so we have stateful versions of the usual operators where you actually feed in uh, your data, but you also tell uh, it a function which takes care of the uh, stateful computation. So in that regard, it's uh, somewhat similar to the Spark API. If you want to go to a more complex example and see a bit more Java boilerplate, the most complex stuff that you might write uh, in Flink would be uh, one of the sources that you have to implement. So this is one of the most difficult things to, to actually write. That's why we are showing to you, because that's presumably one of the most ugly ones. But uh, there, because our sources never stop running, uh, to actually do the checkpointing properly, you need to also fetch a lock. But that's basically as that's the most difficult thing to do. We have one abstraction that is so, uh, somewhat close to SAMSA's solution. Uh, it's called operator state, and you can use it the same way. Uh, anything that goes in there is taken care of. So what are the new features that you can expect from the upcoming Flink 010 uh, release line? Uh, one of the things that was missing is the internal operators were not checkpointed. So if you were relying on Flink's internal SUM aggregations or window aggregations, uh, that wouldn't do the checkpointing job for you. Uh, now, it was a, a great focus to make uh, most, uh, al almost everything that we could checkpointed. Uh, we've also seen a couple of uh, access patterns and there are uh, nice abstractions to make those easier. The state backend interface got a bit more flexible. So now you cannot use it in, in a local setting, but, but you need a partition setting for that. Those are the main ch changes in the upcoming release when it comes to states and, uh, and the interface that you can expect from them. Okay, let's dig a little bit to, to performance and, and what can you expect when it comes to performance and performance of fault tolerance and statefulness. Uh, usually when it comes to performance of streaming systems, you got to look at two numbers, throughput and latency. Uh, this time we are going to look at, uh, at throughput because that's, that's a mo more important because we would like to showcase you that how the throughput degrades when you actually switch on fault tolerance. So this is uh, from uh, a data artisan's blog post, so the picture is courtesy to them. Uh, what I would like to showcase you here is if you look at the fault tolerance mechanism of Flink, the p p uh, throughput hit that you take from actually switching on fault tolerance in Flink is around 5-10%. If you do the same in Storm, you lose around 80% of your throughput. So it, it does matter whether you use one uh, fault tolerance algorithm or the other. What happens if we go a step further and go to statefulness? So the difference here that we, here checkpointing is just switched on and the state is really minimal that we are checkpointing. What happens if we go to a, a state which is a little bit bigger? So now we run a, a word count application with Flink and with Spark streaming. And uh, if you run it without checkpointing and without statefulness, uh, these are the charts that you get. Uh, if you switch on statefulness and you um, and do the, the proper stateful counting uh, in both systems, then the performance of Flink degrades around 20% and the same thing in Spark is around 70% because of the, the different architecture between uh, drawing these snapshots and because of the solution that Spark streaming gives you of co-grouping this other stream. So, uh, as a summary of uh, this, uh, the stateful solutions that we have seen today, Storm doesn't uh, have uh, a stateful solution in the basic API, but has it in Trident. It's, uh, it's easy, easy for outside access, but maybe not the, the best solution because if this uh, commit phase, Spark integrates really nicely with uh, batch processing. Uh, but is a little bit limited and not the most natural because it has a different runtime. Uh, SAMSA has this efficient log-based log approach but lacks exactly one semantics and Flink has this lightweight solution where we try to provide 
uh, flexible backends and interfaces, but in the O9 uh, version, you have to be aware that the internal operators are not yet checkpointed. And one of the things that we sort of omitted during the talk was that uh, in Flink, if you want to achieve exactly one semantics, you need to coordinate with the durable source. Thank you very much. And the floor is open for questions. Uh, hello, I'm Kamil. Uh, great presentation. Um, could you tell me what big could be the state in each of these uh, frameworks? I mean, especially we know that in Samza we can store state in this like level DB where it could be like huge because it's persisted to disk. At how it looks in Flink or Spark? Yes. So. The, the initial solution for Flink was, uh, back in the previous release, uh, or, or the default solution was to persist this state to the memory of the job manager. Of course, that's, that's limited. But that's why Flink also has this uh, state backend interface where you can go to disk or go to uh, an outside key value store you name it. So all you have to do is to, to implement that state backend, and then it's as much as your, uh, your state backend can hold. In practice, uh, a parameter that you can play with is how often that you, uh, uh, you draw these checkpoints. And with that, you can somewhat uh, limit the, the throughput that needs to be handled by the state backend. Because the way you can think about it, the streaming topology is collecting and aggregating some state. And every now and then, you do this checkpoint. Because on paper, you could maybe, maybe if your key value store could handle the load, then you would just use a key value store. You wouldn't use a streaming system. So practically, you use your streaming system to decrease the load that is going to the key value store, if you look on the state side. Uh, when it comes to Spark, because it's uh, treated as a D-stream, uh, practically your, your memory is the bound to, to that computation, or, but not the memory of the job manager, obviously, but the memory of the cluster. Yes, please. Yes, I have a question on. Uh, so we, uh, you are going to introduce map with state uh, in Fling 0.10, uh, but we also have actually forward that. That's more or less the same thing, right? Forward the uh, the state, and then that the left uh, hand side of the second uh, uh, is actually the state. Is it? Uh, different or or, or 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 it's actually just the same thing but with two different names not yeah it look, looks the same and sort of the, the the things that you have to implement for it is is uh, yeah it's practically yeah a map with states you can view it as a forward that is checkpointed yeah We don't use the internal fold operator for it, but you conceptually you can think of uh, it like that. Yes. My last question, maybe. Uh, so I have a question to your benchmarks. Uh, like, uh, on what platform did you run it, and how many nodes, and what was your source? So. For uh, for this benchmark, you can go to the Data Artisans blog post about it. But it was uh, 30 machines and 120 cores. And for the other benchmark, yeah, uh, it, this this is the one that I was uh, thinking about. Yeah, uh, this was uh, measured on, on sort of a toy cluster with five machines but 40 cores, and uh, the data was was generated by our internal data generator. So they they had a source and they, the source was, in, in the topology, the source was generating data. Ah, OK, so, OK, interesting. Thanks. That's not necessarily the most easy thing to do for Spark, if that's, that's a question. No, because I was thinking maybe you would use, like, have, like, uh, maybe you would have some kind of Kafka cluster where you just have filled one topic. And because and here, it doesn't really say anything about how parallel you run it, like, like how many partitions, et cetera. So it's kind of. 
difficult to say like how could one is or the other in a more production like system yeah that's that's true too so a proper way to do reason about this benchmark is to publish a blog post like the data artisans guys did and explain the details because the devil is in there Thank you. Thank you.